Turn It On, the Level 42 Fan Podcast is in no way affiliated with the band. The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed are solely the speaker's own. Five, four, three, two, one. Welcome to Turn It On, the Level 42 Fan Podcast. We are here today with our typical trio from here in the U.S. Here to talk the time away with all things Level 42. The convivial Mikey Payne. Say hello, Mikey. Howdy, everyone. The irrepressible Winston Walker, wind man with many faces and many names. Please say hello. I have one face and one name, but whatever. How's everybody doing? <laughs> all right. And I'm Bob Consonant. Also saying hello to all the Level 42 fans out there both past, current, and future from all over the world. We appreciate you being here. Gentlemen, it is good to talk to you again uh, for another Turn It On podcast. Um, right back at you, Bob. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to throw, you know, I know we're going to be uh, spending some time today kind of pulling the petals off the rose that is Changes 2, Mike Lindup's long-awaited follow-up to Changes 1. Uh, but before we get to that, we had a nice little surprise at the time, of, you know, this week of when we record this episode with the audio release of Live at Switzerland, a show from Lugano, Switzerland, that is now available on most streaming platforms uh, from the band. So, I, you know, I didn't see this one coming. Uh, I don't know if you guys have had a chance to listen to it or you had any take on it. What, what's your opinion? Well, I, um, I have not listened to it. Um, I wasn't aware of what it was, but from what I understand now, it's I've seen the video uh, yeah. quite a few times. Um, which is really good. It's a uh, you can probably find it on. I believe it's still on YouTube um, yes. because they record those shows and make them available. Uh, it's really good quality. Um, it's a good good gig, and yep. uh, that Logano uh, festival has been going on since like the seventies, <laughs> and yep. it's like f free. Open air and free. Open air and free. It looks beautiful. And, you know, I hate to sound like a dummy. The first time I saw that show, I thought Lugano was in Italy. Um, oh, was, well, I probably like, thought the same thing because it sounds Italian. Yeah, and, it, you know, there's so many of those piazzas going on and they have outdoor shows all the time. But, yeah, it's uh, funny because I saw um, one of my favorite guitarists, Mike Stern. Mm -hmm. uh, he was there one year and... I watched it and I bet I probably thought, yeah, this is this is like some little town square in Italy, but it is Switzerland. I believe that same series of gigs, uh, Incognito played that same festival that year. Yeah, very good. How about you, Mikey? Have you had a chance? Yes, I, I remember seeing it on YouTube several times and well, one, having level 42 there, but I can just imagine sitting in that square with the scenery and the sounds and the, it must have been an incredible uh, concert to attend. Um, and I think it's special for the U.S. fans in, in regards because that was the same year that level 42 returned to the United States back That's in exactly right. back in 2010 uh, with the same set list that's on this uh, new uh, DVD release. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, as a matter oh. of fact, it, it, it was... they. So they played that Switzerland uh, Lugano on July 2nd. And then they did a couple of uh, UK shows, like January 17th and January 18th. And then that's when they came to the US for the first time in, in, since whenever. So it is a really interesting time uh for the band to have come because you know we were able to see all that a and you mentioned a set you know that set list mikey i think i really like the fact that um almost there was on it dream crazy was on it which you know you don't get very often right i think the only track that's that wasn't played on the Zer on the uh on this dvd that was played on the tour was uh 43. yeah oh my god can you believe that Ooh, well yeah I so correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think this is on DVD. I think they just did the audio. Correct. It is just a, yeah. It's, it's available on all streams. But I think maybe Mike's talking about the the video and even though. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
Yeah. I made, my own boot, I made my own quote unquote boot <laughs> DVD because I like to archive the stuff. So, yes. And you did a great job with the artwork. Of yes, it. you did. Yes, you did. Yeah. Well, I did yeah. not. I did not do the artwork. Um, okay. That would be uh, Julio, who does lots of great fan artwork. Um, I roped him into doing that. Very um, cool. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, the set list is, I didn't even realize until you guys just said that, oh, that's the year that they came back. Uh, and you guys, I mean, I know, Bob, you saw them in New York, right? Well, I saw them in three different places. I saw them uh, in uh, Virginia, uh, Annapolis. This is where they started, and New York as well, yeah. Yeah, I, I do, yeah, Dream Crazy is awesome. Anytime they do Kansas City Milkman, I'm a sucker for that song. Yep. Um, and obviously Star Child. And I noticed, one thing I did notice because I peeped a bit of it today, mm -hmm. is the the synth lead in Star Child. Is it Star? No, Love Games. Love Games, he's, yes. He's, he's using a different sound. That yes, he is. Yes, a he lot is. of the times it sounds like, he, you know, he's kind of got the exact patch from when they recorded it or <clears> something. <throat> but this one's definitely, definitely different. Um, yep. I, I totally noticed that, too. Yeah, so... <clears throat> um, and for me, it's it's uh, that's 2010. Mm -hmm. You know, that's about four years after Mike Linda joined the fold back into level 42 again. So for me, it's it, to me they they seem like a lot more relaxed outfit at that point in 2010 going forward. Yeah. Uh, after having Mike sort of come back and get into the groove again. Yeah. And I noticed the same thing about Love Games, Winston, and um, <clears throat> a couple other things that really stuck out for me was, you know, often when we talk about Pete Ray Biggin, we don't talk about the subtlety of his drumming, but he is doing some really, I guess, subtle word, subtle is the word I'm going to stay with. It's really subtle stuff on a lot of these songs. He, and it's probably better seen visually than listened to, uh, but I'm really impressed with his performance in that show. Um, what well, else? I well, one thing I want to mention because you brought up Pete. I, first of all, I love his love his playing. Yep. I whoever's idea, and I hope it was Pete's idea, to <laughs> not be in the back of the band but be on the side. Yeah. Inspired because I hate that you can't see a drum if you're at a gig. You can't see a drummer. It's hard to get a picture of the drummer if they're if everyone is standing in front of them. Yes. So with him being on the side. A, it's great for the audience. Yep. Yes. It's great for someone who's watching the video, and I think it's great for the, for a bass player when you've got that rhythm section, and the bass player doesn't have to turn his back to the audience when he's looking at the drummer. Well, you know? right. One thing though, when about that, and I've often wondered, and I think you know, I have a list of probably twenty questions that I would want to ask Mark King right now, and one of them is, how's the hearing in your left ear? Because. <laughs> You know, I mean, it's pretty. It's pretty loud. I don't care what you got in yours. Uh, well, but, it's a it's a drummer. Yeah, but I, I'm thinking like, yeah, he's got uh, those in ear monitors. So, but yeah. I guess that's not gonna. The purpose of that is not to keep the sound out. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I I've always loved. I mean, hey, I'm gonna be honest. Mm -hmm. They haven't had a drummer in that band that I have not liked. Totally. Right, True. And, and especially, um, and I, I am, I feel so bad that I'm forgetting his name, but uh, Ga Gavin Harrison. No, no, not Gavin. Tre Tre um, Trevor, Trevor Smith. Yes, I mm -hmm. loved his playing when he was with, when he was playing with those guys. <laughs> the late, um, yeah. yeah, the late Trevor so, Smith, of course. Yes, I would say this. You brought up Gavin. I kind of see a little bit of Pete in the similarities in their playing because. Gavin would play a lot of stuff that you would think would be programmed. Yeah. <laughs> like a lot of percussion. And Pete does the same thing. Yep. He holds down the groove, but he also puts in a lot of little percussion bits yeah. that a lot of folks, you know, normally dr drummer wouldn't play that, you know. Yep. And they doesn't have to. I mean, obviously with the gig, a bunch of the songs are sequenced. So there's, you know, they could obviously put in uh, percussive bits from a drum machine sample or whatever. Um, but he, he covers all of that stuff, man. I, I, you know, 
he's kind of like Gary, like I always dug Gary and, you know, he can get busy on some yeah. of the things and, but he can also, I mean, you know, he's a super talented musician. He can also, you know, play whatever. And, you know, I would just say, I don't need him to be Phil Gould. Yep. I, yep. you know, I like, I want them to do their thing and it's not like they're getting up on stage and just, you know, freestyling. They have practice. <laughs> yeah. They have to, you know, they're not going to get out there and just do their own thing and like the hell with Mark or Mike, whoever's running the band, yeah. you know, that's all been worked out. You know what I mean? So, I mean, obviously I guess there's, re there's room for spontaneity on everybody's part. Um, but yeah. you know, so I kind of, I kind of dig what he does, but I do that one thing that I noticed like, Oh, cool. Get the guy at the side of the stage. Everybody mm -hmm. can see each other. They don't all have to turn around to look at the drummer or whatever, you know? Yeah. And it's unique to see that ang uh, that angle of, you know, how you play from the side versus looking yeah. straight on, you know. Yeah, in fact, you know, I posted recently because someone asked me to 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 uh, post a Mark King's One Man Wolverhampton video that I shot, mm -hmm. and 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 one of those sequences there, I was trying to actually zoom in and actually catch Trevor drumming, but because we were right up front and. Again, because the old, the way the drummer was back in the back, I couldn't get any shots of uh, of Trevor playing that gig. Yeah, um, it's hard, you know. Yeah, I mean, literally, if you you know, we go to a show and we were doing all those shows in Europe. It's like, hey, you want to be at the front, and you yeah. want to be dead center, right? Yep. Now, if you do want to get shots of the drummer, you got to make sure, like, you got to go left or right of center. And <laughs> I I remember. I guess the 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 Isle of Wight gig that I went to after 9/11, I was far to the left, so I was like almost dead in front of the keyboard player, right? So I had a really good view of Gary, you know, without anyone, you know, because obviously Mark wouldn't have been blocking my view, um, so that. But it's it's hard, you know. It's like the drummer, yeah. you, know, you don't get any respect. <laughs> at least from being seen, you know, in the standard layout. Did you just pull your collar like Rodney Dangerfield, as you said that one? Got no, no respect. I, I didn't. I, okay. I, I have a T-shirt <laughs> on, no collar to pull. No collar. <laughs> I, uh, uh, I, I do appreciate Peach drumming. I think it's a really inspiring story of how he became drummer Absolutely. of Level 42, and I really hope we have a chance to speak to Pete one day. I, I um, so. Because there's a movie out, I can't remember the movie, where a kid becomes a member of his favorite rock band, Rockstar, I think it is, with Mark Wahlberg. Yes. Is that it? Right. Yeah, right. but I mean, you know, you're a fan of a band, and bam, you know, and down the road, you're the drummer touring with the band, and, yeah. and that's a really inspiring story. Yeah, I mean, honestly, that is actually based on a true story. That character, not to get off on a real tangent here, but that that is actually the lead, yeah. the story of um, the guy who did the replacement singer for Judas Priest, I believe. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, yeah, you know. I I see big things for Pete in the future. Uh, he he's just getting started. Yeah, I do too. Oh, he's played. I mean, he you know he's played with a lot of big names. I mean, hell, he played with Incognito, which uh, I was always thrilled about. Like, oh, that's cool. I like both of those bands quite a bit, you know? So, And didn't he play with Amy Winehouse as well? Yes. Do not know. Yeah, but he did. That's cool. I, I, I always go back to, you know, how much, you know, another one of my favorite drummers, Stuart Copeland from The Police, and, you know, Stuart really bought into Pete as a player when they were doing the Gizmo Drum live gigs weren't too many of them, but I think Stuart was really, really approved of the way he drums. So good on him. Well, I think about Stuart is he, he, he well, I don't even want to say it that way, but he, <laughs> he, I don't want to say he leveled up with bass players with Gizmo Drum. <laughs> I could, that's obviously the first thing that came to my mind, no pun intended, right. but I always, I always tease Bob about Sting being a horrible bass player. And he's not, but no, it's just I a know running not. joke. <laughs> um, we'll let you, we'll let you slide on this. Um, so guys, uh, it was uh, July 28th, 2023, I believe that uh, Mike Lindup released changes to uh which was kind of 
a, an album that uh, was long awaited. We, we had singles up to really almost two years leading up to it, about four singles. Uh, and it, it really is an amazing piece of work in terms of what it provides musically. There's a lot of soul, there's funk, there's jazz, there's disco, and there's folk music. So <laughs> he discovered a lot of ground on this thing. And I, you know, I just think the, the the melodies and the production and the lyrics, really the lyrics, you know, uh, really amazing. You know, sometimes we always think we always go to the Gould brothers for level 42 lyrics, but I, you know, I think these stand up with just about anything uh, that, that came out from the band lyrically. I wanted to, you know, before we kind of go down, uh, I don't know if we'll go track by track, but we'll, we'll hit on a lot of them. What, did, what were your overall thoughts on, on, on the album? Let's go with you first, Mike. Being a very bad keyboard player, uh, and a huge level 42 fan and being having Mike Lindup's changes, the original release in 1990 is one of my favorite albums of all time. I like many others here had a really, I was really anticipating what the heck Mike was going to do for the follow-up to changes. And I kind of had some expectations as, as fans do when, you know, their artists release things. But little did I know, and no hyperbole here, little did I know this is what we were going to get delivered. And it it far exceeded my expectations by like a million percent. Yeah. Uh, it was an absolute, it was one of those albums that stand, it's an album. It really, it, it flows well as a whole album. The, yeah. the thematics part of it, the sonic sound of it, the it, it just utter brilliance. And I, I, hey, I'm I'm not afraid to say it. I had tears in my eyes by the last track because yeah. I was so happy with what I heard. Yeah. What about you, Win? Uh, I didn't realize it was two years from when he started dropping singles to the album coming out. I I do remember a lot of people excited like every other week when's the album coming when's the album coming and i'm like when it comes it comes that's what i'm thinking but i didn't know it was two years like that's yeah. a long time it is a long time but i you know because it's a the type of release it is not a major label he has the benefit of dropping a bunch of songs um so that was that to me that part of it was amazing so yeah. i liked all i mean honestly I don't recall, um, what was it? Was was Time to Let Go the first track he dropped? Oh, I can't remember who was that. Yes, Atlanta. it was. Okay. No, Atlanta yeah. was the last one. Um, so, yeah. So I liked Time to Let Go. Yeah. And I liked You Just Can't Let... They, the, 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 what I'm getting at here, <laughs> the songs kept getting better. Yep. Like, ooh, I like this one. Ooh, I really like this one. And then when Atlantia dropped, I was just, I was in heaven. I'm like, that is an amazingly good song. Yep. It reminds me of early level 42 in some respects. Um, lyrically, I, you know, probably like that song the most. Um, so I was, I was excited. And then when the album dropped, um, I think Bob, you got it before me. I think I got it before anybody, and just by right. freak of luck. I mean, yeah, and I got uh, it a few days later. But you let me hear. Um, could it really be? Yeah. And I think you had mentioned like, oh, this is a good song, and I listened to it, yeah. and like, you know, eight bars in, I'm like, ooh, yeah. this is my jam right here. It's still my that is my favorite song on the album. Mm -hmm. It still is, and I really like Atlantia. I love the remix of Atlantia, yep. but I do, oddly enough, I like the album version better because unfortunately, I, I know what remixes are supposed to do. They took out a lot of the great horn arrangements, um, you know, so that I was like, oh, I want to hear all that stuff. And maybe some of the guitar is gone, but oh my God, like I liked every, and this doesn't happen a lot with me. Um, some I have albums that are some of my favorites of all time. And it took quite a few listens before it gets into that st status for me. Um, like, okay, I like 
these are a couple of standout tracks that I like. And I have to listen to it over and over. And then it, eventually it's like, oh, this is one of my favorite albums of all time. I liked all of these songs right away which really doesn't happen. Normally it's like, okay, even though could it really be stood out for me a minute or two into it? Like, oh, I know I'm going to really like, oh, I see where he's going with this. Oh, I really love that. I liked all of the songs and I usually don't do that. I don't even know if I felt that way with the first Changes album, hmm. you know? So, and that is, that has the, that's one of my favorite albums of all time because that's that's a an album that I keep going back to and it never gets old. Yeah. I never have that feeling of if I'm with someone and they put on an album, I'm like, oh, I've heard this so much, I'm I really don't want to hear this. Right. I never get that way with changes. Yeah. And I haven't been that way with this new album. It is it's amazing. It's really, really, really good. And I mean, you know, hey, I'm predisposed to liking stuff from 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 Mike because I love the band that he came from. I loved all of the solo songs that that he wrote with Level Forty Two. Yeah, you know, um, so maybe that helps me love it so much. But it is really, really good. Like changes, he's got some incredible musicians on it. Um, yep. The one thing that took me by surprise was I was not expecting to hear other people sing lead vocals on songs. Mm -hmm. Good point. Which is great. You know, it's like, okay, well, to me, and I'm just, you know, I'm not speaking for Mr. Linda here, but there's no ego there. Like, no. okay, it's my album. I don't have to be singing this song. That's you know, right. Who's the best to sing this song or whatever? I want to bring in other people that I that I like, that I respect, I want to work with. Hey. Well, he's a collaborator. Okay. You know, he's yeah. a collaborator. And and I think that's a great point. When you know, I, I was a, my first listen, um, I was a little bit surprised not to hear uh, him sing a couple songs, at least, you know, lead. But I got over it really quick because of the quality of the songs. Um, uh, and the other thing I want to just point out is just when we talk about the production, the, you know, however many years this was in the making, obviously how personal this album is to him, you got to give him a lot of credit from the standpoint of, you know, I was listening to one interview Mike did um, and he said, you know, uh, this is not a, uh, a good, um, maybe it's not such a good business model to do this. You know, he, I think there was a, a level of sacrifice that he, he made for this uh, certainly I'm sure financially to get this quality of work and to have so many collaborations. Um, and so I, I just applaud him so much for sticking with it uh, and really, you know, changes one was a, a big thematic album and this is also a big thematic album. So I, I really give him high props for all that. The job that, you know, Mike Linda sort of, um, let his producers, uh, Tony Economides and Mike Pata, kind of spin golly Mike's vision for changes yep. too. Um, and, you know, not being in music production myself, I didn't really realize how influential a producer can really be to an artist in helping them shape something, a vision or an idea that they have. Yeah. Um, I did want to go back to what Wynn said about Atlantia. Maybe we'll just do a couple of tracks. We'll, we'll talk about them. And we'll start with Atlantia because I agree with Winston. It does really set the tone for this album, um, both musically. Uh, it, you, you think about um, Changes off Changes 1, and that kind of sets the tone. This is the same thing. It is a, a really such a great song. And, and the line, you know, uh, well, obviously, you know, he, he's talking about race a little bit with uh, neither being black or white. And he's kind of lived through that. Um, he, he's kind of letting you into what it's like to live like that. And, and he doesn't really understand why it matters to people. And he's right. Uh, but when he says we're all shards of the divine, I think that is like such a great line. And you don't have to be religious 
to really get it. it that's a line that applies to all people. <laughs> um, I, to- I totally agree. I totally yeah. agree. So, yeah, uh, it's, uh, like a, I don't know, I mean to cut you off, but no, go ahead. It's a typical Linda song. Yeah. Where it's, I mean, and I kind of felt that way for Low 42. There weren't a lot of, you know, oh, baby, I love you, dance with me tunes. <laughs> Lyrically, right. there was something to be said. Um, and a lot of his songs are are like that. So it's like, hey, I can, if there was just no vocal, I'm loving the groove, but that that takes it up, to, that puts a, you know, that's the topping on the cake. I'm trying to stay away from another level type stuff. <laughs> it's, <okay. laughs> it's hard. Yeah. Mike, Mike has a very innate way of, you know, because listening to level 42, there was only always a social conscience in, in some of the lyric writing, which, you know, with songs like the chant has begun, I want eyes, um, you know, not, not so much getting political, but, you know, talking about some, some really important issues and not coming across as being preachy about it, yeah. but just kind of, you know, yes, music's important, but so are other things. And, these things are important to me and these are my thoughts about it what do you think you know it doesn't they don't try to force an agenda on you but they kind of make you think and and i wish more people these days were like that (laughs) um but yeah it's um a lot of people with the original changes bob you you brought up a good point about shards of the divine i thought that was again one of many brilliant lyrics on this album Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of people thought Changes, the original album, was a religious album, but it was a very spiritual album. Right. Uh, um, and I think he's mastered that again and taking it to a whole other level. So, yeah. I keep coming to the themes of both change and unity on this whole album. And you can, you can go to Atlantia, uh, Atlantia and... Um, uh, the last song, Courage to Change, kind of the book ends. But even a song like um, World is Ready, um, which has, you know, features <clears throat> Ursula Rucker uh, kind of doing the spoken word on that. Mm-hmm. You know, if I take those three songs, and let's face it, you guys know me, I'm dead inside, you know. Um, but when I, <laughs> when I hear this not. stuff, when I hear this <laughs> stuff, I'm like, you know what? Damn it! I'm going to change too. You know, <laughs> I, was really, I was really moved by some of this stuff. You know, so well, job well done, I guess. Yeah, it's Atlantia, and you know, I'm not. I wasn't familiar. With, you know, I was wanting to come out. I was trying to understand what, what does Atlantia mean. You know, the whole concept of Atlantia, and yeah. and uh, my spouse told me there's a movie about Atlantis or something that I needed to watch to understand that metaphor. Google is but, your friend. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember Mike in one interview talking about that, and I, I honestly can't remember it as we're sitting here talking about it, but uh, uh, again. Uh, and uh, second track, Time to Let Go, uh, Wind brought it up. Um, you know, this one, I, I'm not going to say it's my favorite off the album, but it is a very good song. It's a very original song. I like the arpeggiation <clears throat> throughout. Um, be curious to find out from Mike uh, one day if it was, if he kind of played that live or was just um, uh, programmed. Um, very interesting, though. I love the guitar solo. Oh, yeah. That's what, uh, is that Alex Hutchings? Alex Hutchings, yep. Yeah. Somebody uh, asked me the other day, like, who is that guy? Where did he, I think there was, Something recently got posted with was it Alex and, and Mike yeah. doing something? Yeah, they did and like they a asked, blues thing. Right. Oh, yeah. So it was my buddy Alandis who was the bass player in our band, and you know we were all in the level forty two and stuff. And I sent him. I said, and he's like, "Well, where's that guy from?" And I'm like, "I believe they met when Mike was touring with the Michael Jackson show." That's right. I, and I then he right. was like, he responds, he's like, "No way." Linda play with Michael Jackson. I'm like, no, you're getting the wrong idea here. It's like a tribute show, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so and I'm like, do you honestly think that one of our favorite musicians 
if he played with an icon like Michael Jackson, like you wouldn't know that already. Yeah. Like, there's no way I would have been able to surprise you with that fact, you know. So, it, um, to me, I I hear it, particularly in that song, I hear Holdsworth, I hear a little Jacko. Uh, maybe you know, maybe I'm off on that, but he he does have some definite fusion background. Uh, Alex I Hutchins know. does. I, I I heard tinges of Al Murphy. Yeah. <laughs> well, in that yeah, Al was a hell of a guitar well both Al's were yeah. guitar players so yeah. um, I, I you know I started reading the liner notes I get a kick I mean A some of the musicians I'm very familiar with some of them I don't know um, but when I got to you know got the liner notes and, and saw that Tony Mumrell was singing well, I know him from incognito of course yeah. and i just was like oh this is awesome but the other thing is i love knowing the equipment that gets used in the recordings yep you know like you know unfortunately it'll say you know ernie mccone electric bass obviously bass players would probably want to know hmm, what's he playing but typically on albums like this it's not just going to say keyboards right it's going to say Wurlitzer Rhodes Selena strings Korg you know that kind of stuff what and I noticed a, he's got the Roland Juno 106 on a bunch of tracks yep that was the first real keyboard that I ever had I still love it to this day um and then it says Selena strings which always makes me think of Rick James because Rick James was famous for like they had this Selena string ensemble keyboard that he always used. If you listen yeah. to a lot of his songs, you know. So I was always a, a liner note junkie growing yeah, up. Yeah, me too. And thanks for my, thanks to Mike Lindup too for really putting together a nice um, you know CD package. Really, if you got the uh, the actual physical media from this, it's really good. Yeah, I I agree. And also with "Time to Let Go," that was actually the first single that he released. Mm -hmm. um, for changes too, and of course the timing of that coming right in the middle of the pandemic, right? Um, with that kind of message, I, I think gave even more credence to the worth of that song. Yep. Too, uh, and it's always great to hear something new, isn't it? <laughs> I keep thinking of that song, Mike, as you know, there's probably some high end spa hotel that we that. That could be the theme song, literally, if you wanted to go in that direction. If you were thinking um, uh, commercially, what could we do with this song? I, I, I really could see somebody taking that, at least the chorus anyway, Time to Let Go. Time you know? to Let Go, We Don't Need It All, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, you Just yeah. Can't Live on an Island, I was going to pivot to that if you guys don't mind. Um, you know, it, it is, to me, it's kind of, old school, new school disco. Uh, it's, a, it's a fun song. Uh, interesting song, you know, interesting to think of Mike as um, being out on the dance floor because I think he said himself he's not really that type. He's, he's kind of shy when it comes to that stuff. But fun song and great horns. What do you guys think? Well, you remember when I said with 42, like, yeah, they don't do a lot of songs with, about come on, baby, dance with me. and But here yeah. we have it. So... <laughs> I, you know, I'll just shut up as far as that <laughs> point goes. But yeah, this is a definitely reminds me of, I mean, obviously, because, you know, seems like it's set in a club, but like, uh, you know, kind of disco track. Um, but there's, you know, there's more of a story going on here. Or, you know, it's not just dance with me. It's like about other things. You know, letting go of other things. Um, it's a, you know, I'm gonna fall in the rut here, but this is it's a really really good song. Yep. Um, you know, uh, most of these tracks, the guitar and the 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 brass really stands out. Um, really really good arrangements. Yep. Um, so yeah, I like I said, it was I like this time to let go. Ooh, now I like this song a lot. You know, they just kept rolling, like, stronger and stronger. Um, and I guess, you know, I guess that's what artists are trying to do anyway. Even if they're on a major label, they want to 
lead with a good song and followed up with a good song. They, they shouldn't really get weaker as, yeah. as the releases go on, you know. Yeah. Um, but you get lucky sometimes where you have a, you know, album full of bangers, in my opinion, you know. It's, you know, I mean, there are songs by some of my favorite bands that, let's just say I won't specifically put on the record to hear a certain song. No, totally. Um, not, not saying that I would skip said song, but, you know, it's just like, okay, I know what's coming up next. Um, but this one is like, for me, it's a nice ride. I don't feel like, okay, let me let me get through this song because that next one is, is amazing. It's a good ride with, you know, you don't need the remote. Yeah. Because you're not, for me, I'm not skipping any tracks, you yep. know. Um, Except I would I will say this um, we haven't gotten to Atlantia yet but when that dropped I listened to that song over and over mm -hmm. like I'm sitting here working and I just had that on repeat you know it's so. it's you know if we go through the uh, the or of of all of the uh, Mike Lindup's songs. I mean, that's got to be right up there. At, you know, oh, top yeah. top three. Yes. We haven't... Uh, Mikey, what do you think of um, "Can't Live an uh, Island"? Uh, you can't just live in as, as an island. I, I, again, I wish I could remember what interview I heard it in, but someone was making a joke. But I was I thought maybe they were being somewhat serious about it having another subtle meaning meaning of uh, Brexit. <laughs> right, that would, I can see that. I, I, see. I don't know how much truth there is in that, right. but uh, I mean, I can just see England singing to France or France singing to England. You know, right. come join me on the dance floor. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I thought it was a real fun. Uh, it kind of reminded me of some of Jackson's stuff off of Off the Wall. Yeah, uh, um, having that kind of dis new disco sound to it, if you like. Yeah, uh, the video cracks me up. If I'm really down, I love watching the video. <laughs> Cheers me right up. Yeah, that he's he did got for this track. Quite a few, quite a few views of that video. I forget the number. But I remember seeing it, being pleasantly surprised by that. I speaking of that, I would love to see, and I don't know how much stuff they filmed in the studio, but. I would love to see a lot of that stuff show up online. Yeah. Um, just to see, I mean, we got a clip of him playing drums. Yep. You know, which yep. I don't think I've ever seen before. I'm not, I'm, you know, discounting right. back in the day in the 2010 when they played percussion that, you know, but I mean like a, a proper drum set, you know, right. mm -hmm. um, that was pretty, pretty cool. And I'm like, man, what is that? Like eight seconds? Come on, give me some more of that, you know? <laughs> yeah. Or it's kind of like the, the, you used to have those old videos in the 70s or early 80s where it's like one guy. Well, because I remember a Prince video, and I do remember another video where it's like there's just shots of him playing all the instruments on the song, you know? Yeah. Yep. Um, but there's someone else, uh, someone else's video I saw where they did that. It's basically like kind of like a one-man band, but even though they didn't play everything on the record, you know, it's just yeah. kind of cool, you know? Well, I think you might be talking about Phil Collins. Uh, you know, what he did was he... Uh, he played air instruments <laughs> of every instrument. Oh no! I mean, someone was in the studio, and they there's a mm -hmm. so it wasn't Phil because, and okay. I forgot about that. But yeah, they were literally like just playing all all the instruments: the keyboards, the horns, right. the guitar, the bass, you know, the drums. You know, it's just kind of cool. Yeah. It's always great to see someone who, you know, like you know, a lot of people don't know. I mean, there's video of Stevie Wonder playing drums. Oh yeah, you know he played a lot of instruments on his albums, but you know you don't think of him in that way. So when you first see it, you're you're kind of taken aback, you know. Yep. So it's kind of cool. Oh, and Paul McCartney too, does that quite a bit. Well, uh, speaking of Stevie Wonder, I hope someone, if someone's listening, please give Stevie Wonder Mike Lindup's Changes album because yeah. I know Mike Mike's a huge fan of Stevie's, and uh, if I knew Stevie Wonder, I would give it to him, Mike, but I don't. So. Yeah, Hopefully uh, someone out there will do that. Yeah, and I know he's had a couple of close encounters and he's not really uh, talked with him. You know, I, I'll i jump to the song All Is One because 
that to me is where I really hear um, Stevie Wonder, particularly in this. The the end of that song kind of reminds me of the second part of um, Superwoman. Um, I forget which album, but that you know, we're going back to like seventy mm-hmm. three. Yeah, I yeah. really hear that with the Moog, and you know, I think. I guess it's a mini Moog. Mike's playing it, but I, I know Stevie Wonder used to play these things called Tonto synthesizers, and that the spirit of that song and the sounds of that song really evoke that me. You know, the early Stevie Wonder more than anything else on that album. Yes, I think that track is mini Moog and Moog bass. Okay, yeah. So I don't really know what the you know I'm I'm used to my keyboard heroes playing bass lines the mini moog you know right. yep. like the first like bernie worrell was always a favorite of mine and like what he did with parliament especially when like that flashlight single dropped i was like "Ooh, <laughs> that's that's some serious bass that's some keyboard bass for you yep. that and what was that song Dreamweaver." yeah gary right gary oh, right that yeah. was those two songs really was like oh wow they can do yeah. that with the bass with a keyboard and it was just nasty, you know. Yep. Um, and and the thing with you know, unlike it is today, they weren't playing eight bars over and over. Yeah. You no. know, these were really long, diff- complicated bass lines. You know, with all kinds of crazy stuff going on. Yeah. Right, expanding uh, expanding the riff in different ways, and and yep. yeah. Yeah, you do get Mike Lind up as a bass player on a lot of this album, don't you? With some of the some of the Moog bass he's playing, it's really cool. Yeah, and that that track he said in, that he had sort of an epiphany moment in Utrecht, um, mm-hmm. where he was just feeling all great with the universe. You know, everything just seemed to just come together, and it was just by being in that time and in that space. Yeah. I'm not doing his words justice there, but no, I, I heard I heard him say that too, Mike. Yeah, and if you just there's going to be a lot of babies made to that song. <laughs> I heard Mike you talk. I heard Mike Lindup talk about that. You know that that feeling of everything was perfect in the world, and I'm like, I sat there and I go, wow, I wonder what that's like because <laughs> I can't <laughs> that, yeah, that don't um, don't don't let your wife and kids listen to this, okay, Bob. <laughs> I love them. All right. Uh, could it really be? Uh, you know, for me, it's probably my second favorite song, and it is. As Winston said, first the first time you hear it, you're like, wow, this is just, you're into it from the first four bars. And again, you know, you got a lead vocal with Tony Momrell. I think he co-wrote it as well. Um, and I just love the, uh, the back and forth of uh, I'm going to keep it cool. <laughs> yes, 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 that yes. It's just, I mean, like I said, that was when you let me hear that song. I, like I said, immediately I was like, okay, I'm eight bars in, like, yeah, I'm liking this. And then it has a little change, and I'm like, oh, this is, this is heaven. And it, it, still my favorite. That might change, but, um, I would love to hear that live. Yeah. Uh, just a a great great put that's a song that that puts me in a good mood you know right away when i when i hear that you know but again when the album dropped like i said i was just in atlantia ad nauseum you know but when the album dropped i even though that song is my favorite like i'm listening to this whole album all the time yep i'm starting from atlantia and i'm just letting it go you know and then I typically, like, I, I think I might have mentioned this to you guys when, when we weren't recording one time. I usually will go to sleep listening to music. Like, I kind of, at this point, in my life, I need a kind of a little noise or something to, to, to go to sleep. Right. And I remember getting this album, and I put it on, and I'm like, okay, you know, kick it off with Atlantia. By the time I get to Could It Really Be, I'll be asleep. And then it's like, the album's over. And I'm still awake because I'm paying too much attention. And then I'm okay. I'll start it over, right? And then I'm I'm through the second listening of the whole album. And then I'm like, okay, I'm I'm not as dumb as I look. Let me put on something else because I need to get some sleep here, you know. <laughs> but that I mean, I don't tip a lot of times with albums. I don't typically do that. Like, 
you know, first couple of times I'll listen to it all the way through. And then I just start like, oh, well, let me let me let me hit this song or let me hit that song or whatever. This one, I'm just listening to it all the way through. Um, and I don't know why. I mean, well, I guess I know why, because it's it's re it's really, really good. I really, really enjoy it, you know, but I tend not to do that a lot. Um, um, and, and I'm kind of like a control freak when it comes to music. Like, that's why I don't listen to the radio, because as soon as they play something I don't want to hear, I'm done. Yep. So I'd rather program it myself. Um, and I have a lot of sort of mixtape things that I that I do on whether it's Spotify or typically I just um, put stuff in a folder, play it, you know, my stereo, you know, electronically from my computer. But uh, this, I just, you know, I haven't dropped this into any playlist or anything. I just listen to the album because it's yeah. quality. Yeah, shout out to Edwin Sands on that track too. First, because I thought Mike was doing some of the stuff, but it was actually Edwin Sands doing a lot of stuff there towards the end of the song. Oh my gosh. Uh, that gave it sort of a real Latin sort of oh, highlight yeah. Yeah. there at the end. Well, uh, Alex Wilson is the Alex right, Wilson. Is the yeah. and, and, you yeah. know, I'm sorry to jump in on it, Mike, but I, you know, this is a talk about a change in direction at that song. And, you know, if this was like a commercial album, if that was a, a, a three minute, 30 second signal, it would never go in that direction. But because Mike Lindup has that freedom, just kind of take it anywhere you want and go the full way. Exactly. And, and, and collaboration too, because he, I think Mike could have, Mike, we've heard Mike play uh, Brazilian Latin type stuff on, uh, uh, you know, uh, a lot of yeah, and, yeah, and even his first solo it changes yeah. with uh, Pachau, you know, but he didn't. He let somebody else do it. I do like the, the track uh, with Omar. I saw you in my dreams. <laughs> um, yes, that, that's cool. Yes. Um, that is really, and it was it was great to see him when Mike had that, uh, I guess, listening party or whatever the release party thing. You know, to have Omar there. Um, I always loved that spin he put on Sun Goes Down, um, Living It Up, uh, when they released that single. Uh, and that's that's a pretty good song. Uh, and I'm trying to think, I probably told you guys, like my sister had a, you know, both my sisters are fans, um, and my younger sister, particularly of uh, Mike, and I let her hear um that song and she was like who's that singing because she knew it was <laughs> it just said featuring omar right and she doesn't like i have some omar albums she does not but she recognized his voice from that british soap opera that he was on that's crazy which i um, I did not know he he had done acting, right? Yeah, me either. And and you know she's like, oh, well, he sounds like this guy that was on EastEnders, and I'm like, really? It's like, yeah. <laughs> and then I I did the whole Google thing. I'm like, it's the same guy because I I knew his full name and I told her, but she wasn't sure of the full. She just knew the guy's name was Omar, but she recognized his voice from a TV show, and she really <laughs> likes that. She really likes that song. <laughs> He uh, finger, obviously. he he also sang the theme song Omar to uh, the British sitcom with Lenny Henry called Chef. Oh, in which, I've never seen that, but I know in, in which in which Jack the Jack Check did all the music underscoring for that series too. Hmm. No kidding, I didn't know. That. I didn't remember. Yeah. That. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've never seen that show. Um, again, Mikey mentioned before. Um, one of the other songs about a lot of uh, a lot of uh, babies being made. I, I think that song is the one where I don't gonna... think you guys have an appreciation of how babies are actually made. <laughs> it's not the song that does it. Uh, I'll take whatever help I can get, but I think I just think I just think uh, you know it's just it's a well done song. I love the percussion at the end. I don't know why, but it kind of reminds me of World Machine, that song, a little bit. Um, just, you know, I, I can't even put my finger on it. But I, I, I always hear World Machine. Yeah, I also hear a, 
I don't know if it's the exact melodic recreation, but there at the end, I I hear the sequence of keys that sound like Michael Jackson's Thriller when he's doing the big dance scene in the video. Um, I could be wrong, but I thought it was a little nod. It was a bit Jackson-esque again in that in the latter half of that song. There's no doubt, Mike. He he's definitely influenced by Michael Jackson, and, and uh, I think uh, had he stayed around longer, it'd probably be the opposite way too. You know, um, I wanted to hit on one thing, guys, and that that is the song "World Is Ready." Uh, oh yeah, oh this, yeah. This is my favorite song off the album, both uh, at, from top to bottom, lyrics, production. I, I you know. Anytime I hear that it's going to be spoken word on an album, I just, my eyes roll back on my head. I'm like, oh, I don't want to hear this. But w- with Ursula Rucker, who's, um, you know, a spoken word artist from Philadelphia, um, I, she just, there's something about her. Um, mm-hmm. I hear uh, you. Yeah, there's something about the way she relays the lyrics and the words in this that is really like genuine. Yes. Uh, and I, I just think it's just, just a fantastic song. I, I, I love it top to bottom. Yeah, she reminded me of the uh, Poet Laureate uh, during the last presidential inauguration. In fact, that's who I thought it was at first mm-hmm. when, I, when I heard it, because I, I had never heard of, uh, of Miss Rucker, and that's my loss. And I'm glad that Mike has highlighted someone of her caliber and her message in this track. Yeah, you know, I, I kind of forget how they connected, uh, but yeah, I'm sure. I had that no idea she was from Philly. Yeah, um, and you know, I, I had seen on some of her social media that how how pleased she was with the song too once it came out. Uh, so you know, you think, go ahead, Mike. Oh, go ahead, Bob. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, you know, if we should be blessed with Mike Lindup coming to play here in the states at some point, it would be great. If, like if he's playing New York, that we get uh, Ursula a train ticket and get her to meet. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, you know what I mean. Right, and and uh, and Mike said in an interview that she recorded that track just shortly after her mom's death too. So wow, uh, I uh, to kind of ha- have to sing that and put you know, you know what it takes to perform a song. You know you have to feel those lyrics. You have to you know you have to tap into that those feelings and uh, fair play to her. And uh, it was brilliant. And Bob, I agree with you. World is ready. If I had, if I had to pick one, which is really hard to do on this album, it would be world is ready. And not, not just because Mark's on the bass too, right. But the whole construct of the song, the groove of the song, the, you know, a lot of us, a lot of the fans, you know, wish that level was still writing albums like they did in the eighties or, what would level 42 sound like now? Um, to me, that song would be on any level 42 album. I agree. Uh, you know what I love about World is Ready 2? If you th- the the way Mike sings the chorus, it's almost like a chant. It, it yes, it, it, it kind of even reminds me of um, uh, Madness a little bit off of his on the one album, the way he um, delivers. <laughs> The words mm-hmm. in it, but it's more melodic, uh, and I really, I just think it's great. And I also love the key, the, the keyboard solo towards the end. Yes, and someone recently uploaded a video of this track without the vocals, just the backing, instru- instrumental kind of thing on it. Hmm. And it, it's you hear so much going on in that track too that you don't normally hear when you hear the lyrics over it. Yeah. Um, so it'd be really cool to get an instrumental of this album, just to hear there's so much stuff on there that we're not hearing. Um, but uh, the message again on that song, uh, fantastic message, and yep. uh, it, it just it, it's a great jam song too. Yeah. Uh, it really lends to the the goodness of Mike's Mike Lindup's you know ah. being <laughs> his heart and soul, you know. Yeah, because no lives are inferior, That's and right. uh, it's really important for people to to really understand that too. Um, 
two other songs we just want to hit on real quick. Uh, Teflon Don and, and David. Uh, you guys want to take Teflon Don first? Sure. Yeah, I, like I, uh, I, I, I know there's, even amongst my friends, there's debate whether um, John uh, Coleshaw should be on the track. Uh, some of my friends think that it takes away from the song, uh, and they're entitled to their opinion, of course. Uh, I think it actually enhances the track, mm -hmm. uh, the message of the track, um, because in the world that we live in, uh, sometimes, you know, sometimes you just have to laugh at the absurdity of things. Yeah. Um, and I thought he did it. I thought it was a brilliant way to him kind of, uh, putting those two worlds together and lyrically saying his piece. Yeah, it's, uh, it's I, and, I'd love, I'd, and I'd love to see a video for this track. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like the song. Um, I was intrigued when he announced that, you know, Cole Saul was going to be on the album, and I did not have any idea who he was. So I looked it up, and I'm like, ooh, okay, that's interesting. Um, not a musician, you know. So when the when the track came on, I'm like, okay, I see what he's doing there, and it, you know, I thought it was perfect. I think I'll never think of the word rhubarb t uh, at the same way again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the answer is rhubarb. Um, and then the song "David Goodbye to You," uh, really, a, this is another one of my favorites. I, you know, I'm not a big um, David Bowie fan. Uh, I do like him, uh, and I almost feel like Mike even delivered it like he was David Bowie. Like I could see David singing this song the way Mike Lindup sang it. And I think it's a, a great tribute. Uh, I don't think it's solely about David Bowie, but I think, you know, if there's ever a David Bowie documentary and you roll on the credits, you're probably going to want to There is a David song. Bowie documentary. Well, I mean, another one. There's been about okay. 10 of them. But from yeah. this point forward, when. <laughs> <laughs> any, any David Bowie documentary should have this song as a as the uh, credit music. I had no Agreed. idea that's what it was about until I saw him mention it or heard him mention it in, a, in an interview. Um, well, yeah, I originally thought it was about his father because I think that was his father's name. Right. Yeah, uh, that's what I. That's the assumption I made. And maybe there's a touch of it there, uh, but I really do think it's about Bowie. If you just kind of look at the lyrics, uh, well, he said so. He yeah. said it's about Bowie. That's how. That's the only reason I knew. I would have. I never would have, you know, thought it was about David Bowie, especially knowing yeah. his dad's name. I just I put those two things together and assumed that's what it was. But yeah, I was surprised when he said it was about Bowie. It's a great melody line in the in the verses too. It's very moving. Very moving song. Yeah, and I hear really early level forty two in that song. Hmm. It might just be me. Uh, but I, I hear a lot of, um, even though I think it's a fretless bass on that song, uh, uh, melodically, uh, if, if you're really in that moment of the song with the lyrics and you're thinking of someone in that moment, uh, it's by the end of that track, you're, you're in tears just by the way they close that song. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a great song. The bass and, uh, player does have a rather amazing name, last surname of Malarkey. <laughs> yeah. That is awesome. Malarkey. That's Malarkey. Robin Malarkey. <laughs> yeah. And then well, uh, uh, I was going to say Fragile Heart, which does have Dominic Miller on it. Uh, you know, that's yeah. the folky side of this album. What are you guys' th thoughts about that? I really enjoyed it. Uh, it was nice to see. Might go in the almost acoustic direction. Yep. In a sense. Um, and I love, again, I, I'm a big lyric person too. And uh, I, I absolutely love the lyrics of this song. Absolutely love it. Yeah. Good you know, stuff. you go think ahead. about um, Changes One had West Coast Man, you know. Um, Stop saying Changes One. Oh, sorry. Just <laughs> the original changes, yes. uh, and cha and that so changes had uh, West Coast Man and changes to the sequel uh, <laughs> as uh, Fragile Heart. 
interesting because uh, Dominic Miller plays on that song, and he he's um, he spent the last twenty years playing Fragile. Um, oh actually, right. Actually, he has it. I take it back. Sting usually plays that. Um, and believe it or not, Dominic Miller plays the bass when Sting plays that long. So, I'll strike that from the record. No comparison. <laughs> <laughs> I see where you were going with that, though. Yeah. Uh, and then last one I wanted to bring up, guys, and unless you have more, um, was yeah, I'll talk of, about a few more. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say courage to change. Yeah, that's when the when I got the CD, I listened to it in order, and before the last track, "Courage to Change," I sort of stopped because I knew this was going to be the last song. And uh, I was, and I was just totally in bliss of what I just heard for the first time. And uh, to me, you know, changes uh, to. I, I think Bob, you mentioned it bookends changes the the ninety release perfectly. Yeah. And when I hit play, I was like, okay, this is the last. This is the last song, and it was so interesting that he placed this song at the very end. Because to me, it's sort of like, okay, guys, you've listened to everything I've sang about in my career. If you haven't heard anything else I've done, I want you to hear the music and the lyrics in this song. And beautiful song. And then the end. He, uh, <laughs> you got, I'm going to catch slack for this. I don't care. God. It reminded me of the scene in the movie Xanadu at the end. Okay. When... Uh, the muse, Olivia Newton-John's character, leaves uh, the person that she's been counseling, sort of leaving them to their own advice after all the lessons that, you know, she gave them. And the sequence in that musically, with this whole huge synth flare that he does at the end of this track, it reminded me of that, um, whether I'm taking it too literal or, or not. Mm -hmm. But it was like... Yeah, thanks for listening to all my stuff, but I want you to hear this final message from me right. uh, on this on this track. And as simple as, again, this lyric, you know, take something small, just try to make a change. Like you said earlier, Bob, you know, after listening to this, you know, you want to, you know, do whatever you can. Yeah, something. And, and I just thought it was a perfect track to end this amazing masterpiece with absolutely that is really well said mikey any he's he says the words any change should make us proud and make us feel proud right so right 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 well having never seen xanadu i yeah. <laughs> i i do i'm gonna get that agree with you um <laughs> you know yeah i don't know what to say about that because i don't have any reference because i've never seen it i know of it right um but that's interesting it's not Mike, gonna make me watch that movie though. I gotta be Mike honest. Mike was the one guy in the theater who saw that movie, right? <laughs> I was. I was. I was, yeah. Yeah. It just um, I just I just think from top to bottom, like we st we started from the outset, this is a really strong album. Um and honestly, man, you know, I don't know where Mike goes from here. I don't know if he could do anything better than this. Uh you think about how many years it takes to come out with this and how the concepts all come together over years and the production. I mean, it, it would be a tall order. If this is the last kind of major piece of work we got from Mike Linda, I, I, I would be, I'd be very grateful for it, you know? Yeah. You know, the original changes was a very opti optimistic looking forward um, album <laughs> And changes too. I almost thought should have been called changed, only because <laughs> it's still it's it's still my cleaned up, right? But it's more of a pr pragmatic yeah. um, optimism, if you like, uh, on on this album. Yeah, uh, you feel the man's heart in every aspect of this album. Absolutely. And, and it's not just that, you know, I think you guys said it earlier. It's not that we're, you know, me, you, and when talk about level 42, of course, we're going to probably like the things that they do. But I have to tell you, this, this, again, this was an absolute work of genius, what Mike Lindup did with Changes too. 
And I am, again, Mike Lindup, if you're listening to this, I personally can't thank you enough for uh, delivering this to the world. It was brilliant. I, I think you could thank him enough. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think it is Buy safe. Buy a couple more copies, bro. <laughs> I think it is safe to say um, that, you know, it might have been this album that really is a catalyst for a podcast that we have like this because there's so much to talk about with this particular one album. Um, and, yeah. it, 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 you know, I don't know. There's when you talk about the depth of something like this, it's it's not something you can really get in a, a Facebook post. You know what I mean? Right. So uh, I'm glad for you guys uh, to be around and we can do this. And, and I also thank Mike Lindup too for uh, putting this together. Yes. So and, can and, anybody and, say that they like this better than the first album? I can't. I mean, I can't, I can't even go there. Like I can't rank oh, them. I see. You know what I mean? I'm, I, <laughs> That would be like I know we always have problems with okay, what's your favorite song? Like I don't typically have a problem with that. Like I can pick my favorite three songs or one song from an album. Yep. But I would have a hard time saying, Ooh, I like this one better than the first album, or I like the first album better than because they're both really, really good. And you know, it's two albums by a guy who I don't skip any of the tracks on on the albums. Right, nope. you know, so it's like, huh? And but I've lived with the first album for so, so long. If I feel like okay, if I've had twenty years with that album, I need twenty years for this album to give it a fair shake. As far as if I if I was, you know, if you know the whole desert island disc thing, or you got to make a choice. Which one do you like better? Like I can't go there. I can't either. It to me, they're equal. They they again they book in each other perfectly to me i'm gonna go out on a limb and i'm gonna say i actually prefer changes too um you know changes the original album uh i do love and i'm i'm with win that with that album i don't fast forward through anything either um but i just think i, I just go back to when i first heard that album and when i first heard this album and Honestly, guys, I, I I didn't listen to anything else the entire summer, I, to the point when I was I was wondering if all the other songs on my iPhone were getting jealous because they were not, <laughs> because they were not getting used. Um, but so maybe it's because it's newer. But right now, that's where I'm at. I remember in one of our early production meeting calls, Bob, you saying that that it was just on constant repeat, and I was I was right there with you that week in particular. Did you, did you say iPod? No, I said iPhone. iPhone, okay. Yeah. Okay. I was just talking about that with someone the other day. I was like, yeah, yeah. as soon as I got a, an iPhone, my iPod went in the trash. Not in the trash, yeah. but you know what I mean. Like, um, <laughs> but yeah, I that that was like great to have an iPod. Like, oh, I've got all this music with me, but I, it got retired. Yeah. Um, well, I I hope that we. Uh, I know Mike has a date coming up soon, or is hopefully going to play some of these tracks live uh but i hope down the road uh there's a opportunity for him to really do a an expo of his entire works with a with a band you know stuff from the first album and the new album and all the albums in between yeah I, I'd, lo I'd love to see a show dedicated solely to the work of mike lindup that would be amazing um on that note guys uh we should probably uh move along for this episode you know hopefully uh in a future episode maybe not too long in the future we'll be able to talk to mike lindup himself about these songs instead of us rambling about it uh and i want to thank you guys for another uh fun episode yeah right back at you same, right back same, at you same. oh let me just shout out um yolanda charles i think she does a lot of good work on this album playing great days. point great point yes uh, she's really, really good. I, you know, hope I hope to get to see her live one day. Yeah, you sh and anybody who hasn't, they should also follow her on Facebook. Uh, she's uh, she'll play, um, you know, she'll she'll play the bass for you. She'll sing a little bit. It's pretty cool. She's uh, she's great. That and, and I'm glad you mentioned that one because also the other players and artists on the album, uh, the backing uh, vocals, the other players. 
absolutely no one everyone is uh brilliant on this album they're uh they all deserve credit for the work that they put into this as well yeah and i'd be remiss if um when we talk about uh, you just can't live on an island i believe Nic nicole thompson is on that song as well from level 42's yep. touring band yes yes so good on him listen i want to thank uh, everybody who tuned in today um well, uh, it's been great to share this. Please keep tuning in. Subscribe if you can. Uh, for Winston Walker and for Mikey, she cried her pain. I am Bob Considine. We are leaving you now, but we will wait until you return. See you next time.